called Croc Croc, which was acquired by Box last year. So just to kick things off, I'd like to see a quick show of hands. How many entrepreneurs do we have in the room here? A lot. Great. And how many folks here are considering going into entrepreneurship at some point? All right. So I'm going to tell a little story about my company, Crocodoc, our experience building a business in the enterprise space, and then how we joined Box and where, really, where we're going forward um, at this point. So I'm going to keep this pretty lightweight. There's some, some pretty crazy stuff that we've gone through, some really exciting things as well. And I hope that this will be interesting uh, in ret retrospective to see the path that we took in the enterprise. Um, and for those who may be getting into entrepreneurship, I want to share some tips and thoughts looking back at the experience. So I started my company about eight years ago from my dorm room at MIT. Uh, we, our first product was called WebNotes, which was a spectacular failure, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, we pivoted from WebNotes into Crocodoc, and then within Crocodoc had another uh, couple pivots in there. Um, but we did come full circle in the end and had a really interesting experience. So this is me at the MIT Career Fair trying to recruit founders. Um, career Fair is probably not the best way to do that, uh, generally. Um, but it, it did work and kind of uh, helped shake the, the friend tree a little bit and, and get some uh, of the initial team on board. Uh, I convinced some folks to drop out of their PhD program. I plucked someone out of Oracle after they'd only been there for a few weeks. Uh, I met one of our founders here in uh, a waitlist environment doing an experiment for NASA. So crazy background of the team, um, but we ended up putting together some, some really good founders that helped us get some, through some difficult times. Our first product was called WebNotes, and we built essentially a series of browser plugins so that if you're doing research like you're a student, you could actually annotate web pages and PDF documents from within your browser. And we spent about two years working on this and actually built a really great technology, great user experience, really good product all around. Um, and we had a very simple business model. This was a whiteboard that we had in our uh, office at the time. You can see our, our roadmap here. It starts with launch, and then obviously we're going to launch again and, and profit wildly. Um, <laughs> so in retrospect, this seems a, a little naive, but to us this was really, we were convinced we were building something that was so great everyone was going to use it. Uh, as you'd imagine, it didn't really work that way. And uh, we built a great product, but at the end of the day, we kind of failed Startup 101, which is we didn't solve a real problem. Uh, we bought a brought a bunch of great features to market, but we were catering to a market that wasn't going to pay for this, and we weren't really solving a hair on fire problem. So we did have some interesting learnings from this WebNotes product before it turned into Crocodoc. So we looked at how people were using this tool and saw that where it was really taking off was when people would upload PDF files, display them in their web browser, and then actually annotate them. Like you were highlighting comments uh, or kind of working with a colleague to review a PowerPoint slide. So we said, you know what, this is really interesting. We're going to rip this little piece of functionality out of WebNotes and create what we're going to call Crocodoc. Uh, it's an animal name plus the simple document, which is, should be obvious to anyone who's going to build a company in this space. <laughs> so a Crocodoc was focused on document collaboration. So you could upload a PowerPoint document, a PDF file, a Word file, view it in your web browser, and share that with your colleagues who could also see the same thing and add all sorts of comments and annotations and collaborate in real time around the document. So this is a screenshot of what it looked like here. Um, and we did a pretty good job on this as well, um, solving a big problem. And we started going down the track of document collaboration and just collaboration in general. Um, turns out there was some harsh competition there, including a company called Box. So we kind of didn't really go down that path. Um, but we did have a really interesting learning on the technology side that eventually allowed us to start selling this technology to developers. And the insight that we had from this work, both at Crocodoc and, and at WebNotes, was that when you're talking about displaying something like a PowerPoint document in your web browser, it's nearly impossible. So if you look at other kinds of content that have successfully migrated from the desktop to the web, you've got photos, you've got videos, and that's really easy. But documents hadn't made that leap yet. So the opportunity that we were uh, really interested in is can we solve a broader problem here um, beyond the scope of this one collaboration app we built and actually power apps all over the, the world um, that bringing in content like documents. So many of you may have seen this problem before uh, where you're trying to take something like a simple PowerPoint slide and view it on your mobile device or your web browser. So here's what the slide is supposed to look like. Here's what it actually looks like on your iPhone. Android doesn't ship with a built-in PDF viewer or PowerPoint viewer, so you're out of luck there. And in your web browser, the best you'll get is a, is a lengthy download. So imagine you're an app developer building apps around content, especially in the enterprise space where this is critical. You're really out of luck when it comes to actually showing that content to your user. So we developed uh, the Crocodoc technology that essentially takes all sorts of documents <laughs> as inputs and allows developers to convert those to high quality HTML, which they can embed in their web and mobile apps very easily without worrying about all the intricacies of actually getting the document to look good uh, on different devices. 
So there were four pillars to the Crocodile technology that we really focused in. Our team was only seven people, mind you, so we really had to choose our battles very carefully. Um, the four pillars that we built the company around as far as the product we delivered were around rendering quality, making sure that documents look exactly the way they're supposed to in PowerPoint or Acrobat or whatever the native desktop viewer is. Really fast performance so that documents just show up right away. Uh, they work even well on mobile devices. Full mobile support because that's obviously super important uh, as people are kind of uh, on the go and using apps everywhere. And then just ease of integrations for developers. So these were the four pillars of the product that we built our business on. And we tried it out. We did an integration with Yammer, who is a SaaS company, which was our very first customer. And their users were uploading all sorts of documents to Yammer, but the best you could do is then download a document, make some changes, and upload a new rev revision. So we partnered with them. You can see in the screenshot, now people on Yammer could actually click on a document, see it on Yammer's website, and actually, if they wanted to, collaborate with their peers by adding comments and highlights and other types of annotations. So this was a huge hit. Yammer loved it. It opened up a whole new workflow for them. Their users loved it as well. Um, so we did another deal. We uh, worked with LinkedIn so that recruiters uploading resumes to LinkedIn could actually associate those with user LinkedIn profiles, pull up a profile on LinkedIn and see the PDF award resume right in line with the rest of the website. It sounds really simple, but if you're trying to build a competitive offering and really deliver a world-class user experience, um, you need a way to do this and there's just nothing you can do really as far as documents goes that works this quickly and this reliably. We did other deals. SAP used us internally for their Salesforce to pitch their sales decks on their iPads. Um, and Blackboard and a whole other bunch of uh, e-learning companies we're using us to actually let students and teachers uh, review course assignments. And even today, teachers are grade grading literally millions of student assignments uh, using this technology. Um, and it's, it's really fantastic. So when the company started, revenue was just not coming in the door, right? We were just focused on building cool features because obviously people love cool features and they'll buy it, right? We shifted into a mindset of solving a very narrow technical problem, but it was an opportunity we knew that we could do better than anyone else in the world. And as soon as we did that, we became very profitable very quickly. And we started closing a whole bunch of enterprise deals uh, and really prioritizing that across the, the whole board and getting to the point where we're building a reputation as this company that was solving this really tough technical problem and selling these tools to developers all over the place. So if you look back at our initial roadmap, it actually wasn't that far off. The timing was a little bit <laughs> questionable. Um, but we did, we did get there. Um, and whereas we were just face planting the whole way uh, in the first half of the company, we were pretty psyched in the, in the second half of the company when we were really just focusing on closing enterprise deals and building the business. So we joined Box last year. I had known their CEO, Aaron Levy, for a couple of years leading up to that and was really interested in what they were doing, partially because we almost competed with them. And I'm glad we didn't uh, and stuck to something really uh, different that we could focus on and really blow out of the water. Because it turns out Box is blowing things out of the water now. And for us as a startup company, it's a great opportunity to really join, uh, go through this whole process, join a much larger company with way more resources than we ever could have had. We went from a seven-person company to Box, which is almost 1,000 people now. Um, and we can still do what we wanted to do at the end of the day, which is really transform the way that documents and content in general are viewed online, both by end users and developers. And for those of you who may not be familiar with Box, they're really the leader in enterprise content collaboration. Uh, the vision at Box is really to let, make it very easy to share, manage, and access your content from any device, um, which is pretty similar to what we did. But obviously, Box is being used at companies all over the place. We've got amazing brands, um, 200,000 businesses and growing, 20 million users and growing, and 97% of the Fortune 500 are using Box. So this was a great opportunity for us to get in front of a whole bunch of folks that we wouldn't have been able to otherwise as a smaller company. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about what we're actually doing at a company like this because a lot of entrepreneurs kind of look at an acquisition and wonder well, like, what actually happens on day number one. Um, so we really have been working hard at Box to take all this technology we've built, take the business that we've built, and really just scale it. So uh, what you're looking at here is Box's file viewing experience, which just launched a few weeks ago. And it allows somebody to share PowerPoint or anything like that go to box.com and actually click on it and see it. Uh, and I'm actually in that right now. So I'm actually, I've been presenting from Box just using their web app. Uh, you can see that I'm on box.com and I can see all sorts of information about the uh, PowerPoint file that I'm looking at. I can access a feed of comments and actually assign tasks and collaborate with other individuals here. This is really neat. This is why I wake up every morning to do Crocodile and why I still do the same thing for Box because the possibilities are just endless. 
So that's been a lot of fun at Box. Um, and then the other thing we're doing, which is just, you know, we want to go even farther than just the, the simple product integration, is to take this complex technology we've made and really blow it out of the water, make it available to developers everywhere. So we think about content, you know, how much content is out there. So think about your favorite SaaS app, uh, like a Salesforce or a NetSuite or a Zendesk. Think about all the content that's there. Documents, but it could be anything. Think about all the content in the world. It's just there's a huge, huge opportunity there that no one's really tapped. So what we really want to be doing at Box is help Box power content everywhere for developers and for end users. So if you're building an app that has to uh, pull in PowerPoints or PDFs or even videos and photos at some point, we want to provide that fabric to make it really easy so you can focus on building a world-class user experience in your app and again, not worry about the technical details. So I'm going to just go through some real quick slides on the actual technology here just to give you, you all a sense of what we're actually offering to developers and how the technology works. So this is what a PowerPoint file looks like if you just open it up. It's a whole bunch of bytecode. It's really just a complete mess. Uh, and what we do is we take all of that, we parse through the files, and we create a set of HTML assets that developers can use to build their apps, fonts, images, just like a web page is built. And then you have the full flexibility of HTML uh, as a developer as opposed to looking at this garbage gargantuan mess of bytecode here. So we have some really interesting ways that we do this. What you're looking at here is a data sheet that was a PDF file. And we use SVG, which is Scalable Vector Graphics, for instance, to display this in your browser. And Scalable Vector Graphics is a great compact representation for uh, visuals within a file that scales automatically as you zoom in or out or are on a retina display, for instance, and make sure that the details are really crisp. Um, text is huge. Obviously, you want to get text right if you're looking at any kind of a document. So we do all sorts of things from font extraction to calculating a layout within a document and make sure that everything from the baselining to the kerning to other attributes of any given text is, is spot on. Um, there's other types of transforms you can have in documents. Sometimes when you see something in italics, it's just skewed as opposed to actually using the italicized font. So there's all sorts of transforms that we have to uh, make, make sure work in an environment like that. Um, clip paths, if you have text that's cut off, it's actually really hard to do that uh, in a standard compliant way in your browser. Um, and we generate thumbnails, offer full text extraction, so if you're a big data startup, you can work with us and actually pull out the text and use that as an as a, uh, index for your searches. And all things like that. So it's been really an, an, an interesting journey where we, we've taken this company, which was really backwards when we started, turned it around, really got sucked into the enterprise space, found our niche, found this problem we could solve better than anyone else, and then built a technology that we're scaling out now to just just incredible volumes. So for the entrepreneurs here, I'm just going to go through some lessons learned, and I'm happy to chat after this um, with anybody because I could go on for a long time here. So the first thing you've got to do is you've absolutely got to win on product. Uh, it's really difficult selling in the enterprise space, and if you have the best product, you've got a fighting chance. If you don't have the best product, I think it's a waste of time. So really understand what the problem you're solving is. Make sure you solve it better than anybody else, um, and really make sure that this is where you shine. Um, to do that, you need an amazing team. Uh, we had a total of four founders, including myself, uh, myself, and just went through crazy times. We, we raised money, we ran out of money. I moved the team across the country after the WebNotes fiasco and went through the Y Combinator program out in Mountain View. Um, we've gone all over the place and really hung in there and make sure that we, we trusted each other and did whatever was necessary to adapt the company, uh, which is what we were able to do. Um, I mentioned solving a real problem, which we certainly didn't do on day one, and so um, this is probably the best starting point for folks. And once you've done that and you're actually selling to the enterprises, what we found was super important is to really just build trust with the folks you're working with. Startups are really viewed as a risky investment for any company, which is understandable. Um, and what we really use to work to our advantage is to really find the evangelists within a company, build a rapport, build trust, really make them understand that we're not trying to do a quick, uh, just a quick sale here. We actually want to do a partnership and really show where startups can excel and, and how this is a huge value add for them. And understanding the players within a big company. We didn't know anything about this when we started. I mean, I, I have a computer science background. I never sold a thing in my life before this. So we learned a lot just about mapping out an organization and understanding who the influencers are, who the decision makers are. We had examples where we got that wrong and just had a deal go sideways at the last minute because we convinced an evangelist, but the decision maker was not on board at all. Um, one hack that worked out for us really well with sales is just making it easy for folks to say yes. So we would show our technology and we'd demo how we can take documents and transform them in all these different ways. And people would always ask, well, what's it going to look like in my product? So we would actually create screenshots showing how their product would look with our technology. We even created browser plugins for some of our bigger customers. So they could install this in their browser, go to like an Evernote or uh, any kind of app. And we actually wired ourselves in live so they could see how it looked. And this made it really easy for folks to go back to their other stakeholders within the company 
and say, wow, you've got to check this out. Look how good this is going to, uh, going to look here and how it's going to be a positive uh, thing for us. Negotiating is always difficult, and you know you may know there are different styles of negotiating de depending on different outcomes. Uh, we started off negotiating for the best dollar amount, which was not a good way to go about this. Uh, all of our deals, we really made sure to negotiate for the relationship. So we wanted to, yes, have a good deal and get good terms, but at the end of the day, it was more important that we had a good relationship, a solid relationship with our customers, because each customer became a reference for the next customer. And if that person hated our guts, then it was just there's no value as a customer at all. So make sure you optimize to get the, a great relationship and be flexible and be willing to, to pivot a little bit on terms if you need to. And at the end of the day, you want to close the deal. Um, this is where, again, we had no experience coming into this. You know, it's, it's really tough to close a deal, but if you've been negotiating for the relationship, convincing someone that you're the best in this space, you've got the best product, people can visualize what this is going to look like in their app, you can kind of guide things right into closing the deal. It's always great if you can come up with forcing functions, which would be a new version of the product, or some type of uh, marketing event that you can kind of do some co-marketing with. Look for opportunities to kind of move things along because big companies move slowly. Um, and be very careful in guiding things in, and if something feels like it's going sideways, it probably probably is going sideways. So it's a great time to work with your investors and advisors who may have more experience here and just be very careful so you can do a soft landing uh, and get the deal done. And at the end of the day, I think throughout all this, the, you can't understate the importance of just trusting your gut. You know, we didn't know how to do any of this when we started, but still when we were building a deal or even deciding what direction to take the company, when you sleep on something and your gut is really telling you to do something, odds are you should absolutely go and do that. Uh, and that was one thing that kind of uh, got us in trouble a little bit, but generally speaking, kept us on track throughout the whole eight-year process uh, and led us to this great place where we're at Box and are really just focused on blowing this out of the water, operating at a scale that we could have never imagined as a smaller company, um, and just working with Box to really transform content collaboration online. So just want to say thank you guys so much for having us here today. Um, tomorrow we're actually having a free event called Box World Tour, if anyone's interested in just learning more about Box and how that operates as a company. Uh, Aaron, our CEO, is just uh, an awesome guy to watch. He's going to be talking at the beginning of that event. So if you can, swing by and, and take a look. And other than that, I'd like to just say thanks again and open this up for QA. So we have some swag we'll be giving away here. These are amazing box gloves that work with your iPhone. So when everyone's getting buried tomorrow, when you're all getting buried tomorrow, make sure to throw these on and uh, while you're using your, your mobile device. So we're going to give these out to people who ask questions. So I hope there's some good ones. Yes? Did most of your team stay through the transition? Question is, did most of my team stay throughout the transition? No, all of them did. And that was really important to us as we went through the process. We uh, were in a really fortunate place where the company was doing well. We didn't have to, to join another company. And we knew that if we were, it was going to be a team effort. Uh, and Box was very receptive to that. And, and we have everybody on board. That's great. Yes. I was just curious, why, why sell and not just partner with Box? It's a good question. Mm -hmm. Part of the relationship evolved when I wanted to do the, just that. So I was pitching Aaron hard on being a customer. Um, and it was kind of a, a great starter for a conversation. And you know, he was, I think, convinced of the value of the product, but a little concerned that this was such a core component of Box. You know, this should be something that they own, which is, is fair. So that led to a whole bunch of conversations. And really, the thing for us was you know, we never wanted to join a company and just be a feature. Uh, when we joined Box, we have some great feature integrations like the one I showed you, like the presentation you're looking at right here from the Box web app. But we're really a core uh, strategic element of Box's platform strategy. And that is, that's just exactly what we wanted to do on day one. So that's why it was a great fit. And it was a good opportunity for us to go do that um, with a company that we already think is going to win in that space. And so we can kind of ride along with them. In the back. What's the typical um, uh, cycle of your uh, you know, sales process and price points? The question was how long our sales process was and what our price points were. So most of our price points were in the five to seven figure range. I know there's a couple orders of magnitude there. Uh, but we started small and kind of worked our way up as we, as we were able to scale. Um, the sales cycle was about six to nine months in most cases. So it was a long time. It was pretty grueling. We actually got to the end of a cycle and the whole deal fell, fell through at one point. So we had a whole bunch of failures, uh, but a lot of successes as well. Yes? They're letting you operate independently and keep your team together or they have they integrated you into 
the rest of the, the, rest of the box. The question is whether we're independ operating independently at Box or if we're, we're more spread out. So the entire team is working on this initiative, and in fact, we've expanded that team very aggressively. So like I said, we're, we're really focused on taking this technology and opening it up to developers everywhere. So when you think about that pie chart where you've got content in your favorite SaaS app and content in the whole world, we want to power the ladder, and that takes a lot of work. So we really expanded our efforts to do that. Yes? Did you target Box? Or did Box target you, or did you have a board member or an advisory board member that said, hey, look, we need to get you guys together? The question is how we got together with Box. So it was pretty serendipitous. I had a roommate who knew one of the co-founders of Box, so I got lunch with him just to get some advice, and he introduced me to Aaron, so we would chat every few months on, over at McDonald's, over at Fry's, just like about startup -y things, company dynamics. later that this actually came up as a possible business deal, let alone an acquisition. Um, but we did really leverage our network for other types of customers to get warm intros to some of the big companies that you saw me talk about earlier. But we also reached out cold on a couple occasions, but only when we were convinced there was a slam dunk opportunity. And we really went out of the way to build like a browser extension so we could email somebody, show them what this looked like in their browser, and they really couldn't say no. And that actually happened on a couple occasions. Yes? How have you structured like IP intellectual property? Because it seems to me you're kind of like the innovative force. Is this all now boxes, or what kind of freedom would you still have in the future? Yeah, the, the question is what happened with the IP associated with here? And, and as you can imagine, Box does own that now. Uh, and, and there's quite a lot of it. I think the part of the value proposition for us was very simply that to do the kinds of things that I was showing here, it takes many years to figure out. So we became the world's domain experts in this, and, and that was kind of how we were able to dig, out, dig out a competitive motor on the technology we have. Uh, and we're just building on that now even more at Box. Yes? So you were showing the monetization graph and how suddenly it skyrocketed. And I'm wondering what the pivotal point was for that, where you know suddenly you decided, OK, something went right and everything went for that. It's a good question. The, the question was when you look at the chart of revenue, what was the inflection point? What, what caused that? So there were a few of them. The, the main one as a company is we really decided who we were as a, as a company. What was the problem we were solving? What was the specific pain point? Um, what was that problem we knew we could solve better than anyone else? That was a huge problem for our customers. So that, that was a setup. And then we made a very explicit decision when we started going after the enterprise to do uh, kind of a, a more rare top-bottom approach. So we went after the biggest players in that space that we could find, whereas most companies will start off on the SMB side and, and then go up market. And the reason we did this was, A, we were tired because we'd been working for many years at this point. We wanted to fail fast if this wasn't going to work. So when we actually closed our first deal, we were a little shocked, to be honest. And we said, wow, we actually might have something here. Um, and our strategy was very simple. We wanted to close big brand names in the SaaS space that were a slam dunk fit for us, but that other companies would know and respect. Because it was really hard to build credibility for the enterprise customers we're going after when you're a no-name startup company. And what you saw in that graph is a snowball effect. We closed the first deal, made the next one twice as easy, that one made the next deal twice as easy, and we really rode that wave very successfully. Yes? Um, so you were, you were able to find a problem that no one else had solved yet, but that's, that's A, hard to do, and B, like, how did you figure out that no one else had solved it yet and like, decide that you could actually solve it? Like, how much time did that take? How did you bring your team together to actually do that? The question is how we were able to figure out that this was a great opportunity to go after. What was, what was the process? So I think it's, it's pretty rare that an entrepreneur wakes up in the morning with a brand new idea and that you know, it pans out, they get hugely successful, and they never deviate from that at all. I think usually you come up and you're just delusional enough to think you're actually onto something when probably the, you're, you're totally off. Um, but you, you get out of bed and you actually make something happen. You just you try, right? You go out there, you try to sell things, you get shot down, you try to raise money, you get shot down, build a team, shot down. And then at some point you stop getting shot down a little bit. So for us, like, I convince our team to, to move across the country and really kind of do a reset as a company. Um, but the biggest thing for us was just drawing on our experiences with web notes, even though it was a huge failure as a product. Uh, and even though I think that, I would hope that most entrepreneurs are much faster on the uptake than us. It took us about three years before Crocodile was born. Um, but it was a, really a process of reflection on, even for something like WebNotes, we looked at the feature that got the most visibility. Then when we, when we had the first version of Crocodile, we looked at how people were using it, why they were using it. And we found that there was actually a more compelling story to go after the developers building their own apps rather than to go compete with Box and try to get end users ourselves. So just being really introspective and really uh, pragmatic and, and kind of drawing on these experiences and weeding out the, uh, the actual opportunities is something you learn over time. But as long as you don't quit, you really create your own luck, and that's what happened with us. Yes? 
Um, I'm interested. You you were pitching Aaron to become a customer. He says this is this could be strategically important for us. How do you feel comfortable about opening a kimono to a company that could just say, in fact, we're going to build it ourselves? How did you go through that process? The first time it was uh, really scary. Um, this happened with several companies where they said, not only do we not want to work with you, but you guys are just not going to be around in six months from now because we're going to kill you. <coughs> And it, it, was, it was scary at first, but I, I think one of the principles that guided us was really don't go crazy about competition, just build the best product you possibly can. None of these threats ever came to life. No one built any other offerings. Of course, the competitive landscape is always evolving, and there's other offerings that do things like this, but no one ever came close to us in terms of the relentless focus on the quality of what we were delivering. So we really stayed true to that, um, and that's you know, kind of kept us going since then. Yes? Yeah, piggybacking off that, first of all, congratulations. What you've done is pretty incredible, and I think it's hard for anyone to fathom the psychological <coughs> trials and tribulations you've gone through, and success is well deserved. Um, piggybacking on that, off that, as I said, did you guys file any patents, or were you just confident that the IP is in your code and your knowledge base, and that no one else could uh, copy it because you guys have the domain expertise? Sure. So the question is what we did around IP. So as you can imagine, I can't talk too much about any details there, um, but we did take some steps proactively to make sure that our IP was secure. You know, uh, patents especially really difficult with startups. It takes a lot of time. It can be very expensive. Um, you do have limited windows to actually file them, though. So what I would say is it's great to have good advice on that and just be strategic there. It's easy when you're early stage startups to over-optimize for the wrong things. Um, and if you spend all your time writing a patent for something that's probably not going to work in the first place, you really want to balance that and make sure the timing is right before you invest that much energy in something like that. Sweet. I didn't get to give everyone gloves, but I think, I don't know if we have enough for everyone here, but I don't expect everyone will want a pair. So we have You should, bunch. though. <laughs> I'll put them over by the pizza boxes. Yeah, come say hi. We'll hang yeah, out by the pizza hi. boxes towards the end. We'd love to chat and meet you guys. And thank you so much for having us yeah, here. Yeah, thank you.